Uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name's Luke Darnell. I uh, work for a group uh, in Broadcom that designs Wi-Fi and Bluetooth combo chips. Uh, why is this another introduction to Coco TV? Well, Chris Higgs, one of the creators of Coco TV, has given talks on it before. Um, and that's sort of uh, focused on the motivation behind developing it and, um, and sort of a high level overview. And this is sort of an end user perspective. And this is a talk I give inside Broadcom introducing people to Coco TV. Uh, so, Coco TV is a Python plugin for RTL simulators, uh, it's on GitHub. Uh, yes, yeah, so, and this is sort of an introduction for an end user. Uh, sort of getting started on Coco TV, And there's a bunch of examples uh, throughout the slides here that you can get on my GitHub. Um, so I guess why Python, apart from me being another Australian who loves Python. Um, so it's a great language, super productive. Uh, there's a huge library of existing stuff out there. Uh, doing signal processing using SciPy is pretty amazing. Uh, Matplotlib, you know, generating plots from within your, your, um, your simulation, um, you know, putting a TCP server in your simulation is super easy. Uh, there's great online resources, uh, and obviously Python's super popular. Uh, it's fun. I don't know anyone has ever said that about UVM. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you can use the same code in different environments. So. You can write your chip configuration code in Python, run it uh, with Coco TV in your simulation, and then when your chip gets back, you can run it in the lab against silicon. Um, and then I guess the, the other part of that is why not uh, UVM or System Verilog. Uh, I've, I've used it, and my own uh, experience was not compelling. Um, simple things were really hard uh, to do. Uh, everything was hidden behind a million macros, which was terrible. Uh, it's compiled, so for me, anything that's, any test bench that's compiled and you're simulating against a chip of any sort of complexity is a fail for me. Uh, and any code you write there is stuck in simulation land. Um, people do love Coco TV, uh, so this is a quote from David who's here. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I, I think. Um, after using UVM and System Verilog and then coming to Coco TV, you really do, you know, you, you get it, it's great, you should use it. Uh, so Coco TV itself comes with a bunch of examples here. Um, the default simulator it runs against is Icarus, uh, and there's some more in-depth examples here as well. Um, and then my own examples that I have in uh, this presentation are available on my own GitHub. And then this little uh, blue thing here is sort of how you run the uh, test case uh, with the code in each slide. Uh, so this is sort of my own idea of what Coco TV is. Um, you have sort of one part here that connects the, uh, the simulator with, with Python. And that's done through the VPI and the VHPI for, for, um, for VHDL. And then you have this other bit that sort of sits on top of Python. And it sort of teaches Python, you know, about digital simulations. Um, and this is the part I'm going to be talking about, how to use this part. Uh, so this is Hello World, uh, sort of Hello World example in Coco TV. And if you're not super familiar with Python, this might seem a bit overwhelming at the start. Um, sort of, uh, most of my audience I've given this to have been, you know, uh, RTL designers who might have played with Python, but not, not a lot. So <coughs> we're going to sort of cover most of the, uh, all the things here in, in this example. But you can sort of kind of tell here that this is going to toggle a clock up and down 10 times. Uh, you can see this, this function here, my first test, the argument, this is sort of one important part. The, the first argument here in a Coco TV test is the top level instance in the simulation. Um, all right, so how do I actually get access to signals in the simulator? So you use this dot notation here. So you, the dot from uh, you know, the, the argument in the, the previous slide here, you've it's got a clock uh, input. And so this, this clock variable here has now got a reference to that, to that signal in the simulator. 
Uh, you can dig down into the hierarchy here. Um, and then the other cool thing is you can also get references to modules. Um, and then so one sort of difference here is you're actually getting references to signals here, not the underlying value. And for me, this was actually one of the really powerful things about Coco TV because you can pass around these, these references as objects within Python. And you can do the same for modules, which is pretty awesome. Right? So if, for, for example, say I'm interested in all AXI interfaces going into or out of a module, I can you know, create a little function that'll automatically you know, crawl over a, a module and look for AXI interfaces and automatically hook up monitors, which is uh, it's, I think it's pretty powerful. Uh, cool, so I've got references to the signals in the simulator now. How do I actually read them? Uh, so you use this, again, this dot notation, but you use this dot value guy here. And this will return a binary value object, which is another co is a CocoTB uh, class. Um, and it's CocoTB's way of representing um, sort of bi binary values, obviously. And it provides a whole bunch of nice features, little big endian. You can get and set bits using the index notation in Python. It does truncation if you try to assign a, you know, a bigger value than it can handle. And it does unsigned and signed stuff. Um, and then, so, if, and if I'm just interested in an integer value of a signal, you can just, you can use a dot integer notation or you can cast a, a signal reference directly using int. Uh, Uh, so X and Z values, obviously Python has no idea what, what X and Z is, um, but binary value does. Um, and then so all, all sort of X and Z values are preserved when you read back a signal from the simulator and you can use this bin, bin string guy to, to get the representation uh, and that'll sort of include X and Z values. Uh, what do you do if you try and cast a binary value object that has X and Z values? Uh, by default you'll get a value error uh, your simulator simulation will stop, but you can control that uh, through environment variables. So you can resolve uh, x's and z's to zeros, ones, or random values. Um, so cool, we can read signals. Now, what about assigning um, values to signals in, inside the simulator? Uh, so the less than or equal, equal to operator makes people from, from RTL land feel nice and at home. Um, and then you can use this, this dot value notation as well. Uh, and you can do sort of dig down into the hierarchy and, and assign stuff and the same with arrays, although array assignment doesn't work in Icarus. Uh, hex values is pretty dead simple because Python knows about hex values. Um, and then, so I guess the other part of that is X and Z values. Uh, so you can create your own binary value objects here uh, and assign those to, to values in, inside the simulator. Uh, okay, so that's good. We can read and write signals inside the simulator. What next? Um, so we yield. Uh, no, I don't know. Lots of people who've just sort of had a brief encounter with Python might know what this is. My message for you is you don't really need to know. Um, but this is the way you pass control back to the simulator. Uh, and we, you yield on, on what's called a trigger in CocoTB. And for, so for this example, you're yielding here on a timer of 10 nanoseconds. So this will go off to the simulator, run 10 nanoseconds, come back, and you'll keep going. Um, and this is sort of the part where uh, RTL designers get scared. Um, so yields, sort of decorators, generators, coroutines, what, all the, what is all this stuff? Um, the good news is you kind of don't really have to know. Um, so if you're not a Python guru, it's still CocoTB, it's still for you. And if you do want to know, Dave Beasley has some awesome tutorials. Um, go and check them out. Uh, so what other triggers can you yield on? Uh, so timer, I've shown you, you can do edge, rising edge, falling edge, sort of pretty standard HDL stuff here. Um, and this is sort of how you, you do each of those. Uh, 
All right, so we've sort of so far shown how we pass control back to the simulator, but what about within CocoTB? Uh, and this is, CocoTB uses coroutines, and this is actually part of the CocoTB name. It's coroutines and co-simulation. Um, so this, this is a, a pretty simple coroutine here that, that, that uh, will you know, wait 10 nanoseconds. Um, so to do that, you again just yield, so I yield on this wait 10 nanoseconds coroutine, and you can build up coroutines, calling other coroutines. Um, you can also return values uh, from coroutines, so you, you do this by raising what's a return value, so this is another, another CocoTB class. Um, and then, so this is the syntax here for, for getting a value back from a, from a coroutine. Uh, so forking and joining, obviously another pretty important thing you want to be doing in uh, test benches. Uh, so when you fork, this will create another thread of execution in, inside CocoTB and go along and uh, execute that. And, but at the same time, you, you, your own thread of execution will, will keep going. Um, and then, so once I've sort of forked stuff off, you can sort of save a reference to a, to a forked coroutine here. And then you can yield on that guy finishing. So this is a pretty trivial example, but it should have just shows you how that works. And you can also use this join function. Um, and then so this is sort of some more cool stuff that CocoTB provides. So if I want to create sort of a trigger and then trigger on it multiple times, so I can create this, this timer here and uh, save, save a reference to it, this timer handle thing. And then I can yield on that m multiple times. And so that, yeah, that's cool as well, you can pass that into functions and stuff like that. Um, you can also yield on a list of triggers, which returns the first one that fires. I guess that's sort of similar to Verilog join any. Um, and then, to, so using that sort of yielding on a list of stuff, you can do create timeouts really easily, which is pretty cool. Uh, so here we sort of create a timer and we yield on, on a forked coroutine and a, and a timeout value, and then you can save the result here, and then you can check which one fired first. Um, so the test decorator is sort of uh, how you tell CocoTB that your function is a test. Um, and by default, if you sort of fire up CocoTB and run your simulation, it'll go and find all these uh, CocoTB tests and run them all sequentially, and you, you can control sort of how that behavior by passing in the, the module and test case um, command line arguments. Um, and CocoTB generates a JUnit XML file to suck into Jenkins or whatever CI you're using. Um, and then, yeah, so if you, and this is the sort of the final part of the, of the test, so if you want to sort of uh, this is a way you indicate if, you, if your test has been successful or not. Um, and they, these, sort of, these messages here show up in the, the JUnit file, which is pretty nice. Uh, and I guess this is sort of one of the more interesting features of CocoTB is you can iterate over design elements. So here we're sort of iterating over our, our top level dart. And if we find a clock, I mean, this is a pretty brain dead example, but if you, if you find a uh, a design element called clock, hey, let's, let's, let's toggle it. But like I said earlier, this makes sort of passing, you know, looking for interfaces that you might be interested in and, and hooking up monitors really easy. Uh, a couple of little, just handy little bits and pieces for, for end users. So it's Cocoa to be log level, that's a command line thing. If you pass in debug to that, it'll sort of show you all the internals of Cocoa TB if you're sort of interested in, in figuring out how it works or, or you've got a problem. Uh, so thank you, and yeah, once again, this is all the examples in these slides are on my GitHub. Get in there and give them a go. Thanks. Thank you. Do you anticipate support for uh, formal constructs in CocoTB anytime soon? <laughs> uh, I'll you knew I was going to ask it. <laughs> uh, I'll let Chris answer that one. <laughs> yeah, we need to think about that. <laughs>
<laughs> Andre. You mentioned the capability of wandering over the design. Can you actually use wild cards and that? So star clock star? Uh, what do you mean? Like look at like find all the clocks or something like that, which actually has the name clock here within the title of the signal, for example. Uh, well, I mean, you can do string processing, all, all the, so the names are, uh, this example here. So this name's just a string. So if this sort of any sort of Python string processing, you can, can do on that. Brilliant, thank you. Yes. Hello, Luke. So I'm not really a UVM fanboy either, but um, the fact that it's compiled isn't isn't a, a complete negative. One of the advantages of being compiled as opposed to runtime is that the simulator can make optimizations, right? So if in your test bench you don't reference an internal design element, it might be able to optimize it away. Usually to use VPI, and I guess CocoaDB uses VPI extensively, you have to do something like access plus R on the simulator. Mm -hmm. That slows it down usually quite a lot. Have you got some experience of how much slower a similar thing would be running in Coco TV than in UVM? Yeah, so the speed thing comes up a lot, and it, in my own sort of experience, is it's not noticeable, um, and it, the sort of productivity gains far outweigh any sort of speed deltas in actual simulation time. So. Okay, but you did. You didn't really give me an answer. So you said well, I'm saying, at least from my, from my experience, that the speed is not an issue. OK. And again. Uh, this may be more of a question for the uh, simulator you use, but do you support any particular file formats for the trace file coming out? Oh, uh, it's just whatever simulator. Whatever the simulator. OK, yeah. that's my question. Thanks. Other questions? If not, let's thank the speaker again.